And um, for those of you that I've already talked to and said this is a very casual evening, it really is. I wrote a story a while back about a thief in the early uh, 20s that uh, had come into a home and heard the people coming home, so he snuck under the bed waiting for the people to go to sleep, and he and himself fell asleep under the bed, and the people, when they came home, heard him snoring and called the police. Well, I got a, quite a few nice comments about my story, but the best one was a phone call from a Mr. Sandy Mock, and he said that he was very amused by my story, but it was his bed and his thief. Tonight he has a, a presentation that he would like to share with you. Mr. Mock. My wife Pat and I are pleased to present to the society this stock certificate signed by Edward L. Doheny in 1910. He was president of the company. It's the Mexican National Gas Company. Uh, our thanks to Mark Wanamaker for the photograph of Mr. Doheny. So we tend to think uh, of Greystone when we hear the name Doheny, he might say that uh, Edward Sr. was the father of the father of Greystone. In today's world, he'd probably be in jail. Uh, he was on trial on and off for seven years, from 1924 to 1931, as a result of uh, the Teapot Dome scandal. I've been accumulating these things for 15 years, and I have never seen anything uh, with a Doheny signature prior to this. So, Phyllis? Thank you so much. We were taking a group of um, people from the California Historical Society up to see Pick Fair. It, it was just after Piazzadora and um, Rickless, Mr. Rickless had bought it. And we called them and asked if we could bring a group up to see Pick Fair. And they said, oh, yes, that's fine. So we arranged the date with them. And we all met. We went up there. And as we were walking in, the place was leveled. It had been leveled the day before. And uh, they said it was an accident. But <laughs> the city council was unaware that they were going to tear it down. It was the stables to Gray Hall. Gray Hall was uh, a mansion built in 1909 for Harry Lombard, and his stables were pick fair. And then in 1915, he sold it to Lee Phillips, who turned it into a small hunting lodge. In the early teens, there were no houses in the hills there. And Gray Hall had 55 acres, the entire top of the, the hillside. On weekends, they would bring guests up and hunt the small animals, whatever. In 1919, Douglas Fairbanks bought Phillips Hunting Lodge and decided to make it into a grander house for Mary Pickford when he proposed to her. She would not move into Gray Hall because she didn't like Gray Hall. She thought it was too dark and depressing. So uh, he had in the hunting lodge, converted into an 11 room Tudor house in record time in one year. And after it was completed, they were married and moved in. Celebrities and royalty came and it was considered the White House of the West. And Will Rogers, in his, when he was honorary mayor of Beverly Hills, said that his most important job was directing people to pick fair. But um, I'd like to introduce Wallace Neff Jr son of the famous architect who did a lot of houses in Beverly Hills. I'm really delighted to be here and speak a little bit about my father, his architecture in Beverly Hills. In 1919, uh, my father built his first home. It was after the First World War and he was all set to go. So his parents decided that he would have to do his first home for them. So he built a home in Santa Barbara for them. And then in 1920, 21, and 22, my father was in Pasadena starting his career. Uh, and he won an AIA award on one of the first few homes he did. And then in 1923, he really hit it big and he made his first big crash into Beverly Hills and the movie industry. Uh, uh, famed screenwriter Frances Marion and her husband, Fred Thompson, who was a a uh, very well-known uh, 
Western cowboy and a maker of a producer of movies, decided they decided to build their home on, at the top of Angelo Drive. Well, that was how my father got his big break into Beverly Hills. So the house goes all the whole estate goes all over the hills. He was a minister before he became the this uh, cowboy. Well, well, my father, for the Thompsons, uh, designed a 25-room Spanish mansion, a gatehouse, a guest house, horse stables for Fred Thompson's movie horses, and his own horse, Silver King. Houses for the horse trainers, tennis courts, a gigantic swimming pool. This is um, Pig Fair here, and that extension was the guest house. My father did it from scratch. And I am going to list just a few other homes that my father designed in Beverly Hills. The Jack Lemon home, Frederick March and his wife Florence Eldridge, Fred Niblo, where the Jules Stein lived for many, many years, Doris and Jules Stein, and now it's Rupert Murdoch's home. He did two homes for King Veter, those two over there. He remodeled for Claudia Colbert. I, I certainly am awed by my father's architecture, and I'm finding new homes all the time. And I'm just sort of really very happy that he had the opportunity to design that before the Depression when everyone was going mad. Lots of money and flapping around and building these great homes. That was the peak of his career before the Depression. Thank you. But, um, I'd like to introduce Willis Longyard II. And his grandfather was one of the early residents of Beverly Hills. I'm uh, pleased that, uh, and thank Mrs. Lerner for giving us this opportunity for telling you the story about how our grandfather, the original Willis Douglas Longyear, uh, came across the statue of Hunter Boy and Hound. In 1865, Dr. Marlier built a particularly fine home on Chateau Thierry's elegant Avenue de la République. In approximately 1900, he acquired a bronze-covered iron statue of a young hunter and his two dogs titled Valet et Chien, uh, which he placed directly in front of the entrance to his home. Hunter Boy and Hounds was created in the 1870s. The statue became badly shot up during the battles that raged back and forth around the town, with three bullet holes in one dog, the left calf of the boy blown away, a bullet hole through his coattail, and several, several more holes in the statue's base. After the war, the French people consecrated the district around Chateau Thierry with graveyards and monuments in tribute to the valor of their American allies. It was to these shrines, to the American soldier, that W.D. Longyear was attracted during a vacation trip to France in 1924. A staunch patriot and avid sportsman, it was only natural for him to visit Chateau Thierry during his tour of France, and once he saw it, to fall in love with the war-torn statue of the young hunter and his dogs. He was inspired to bring the statue back to the United States to serve as a visual reminder to people here of the valiant effort of our boys in France. After months of negotiation, he was able to purchase Hunter Boy and Hounds, have it crated, shipped to Los Angeles, and installed on a place of honor in the front lawn of his residence at 721 Beverly Drive. He then arranged to unveil the statue with pomp and circumstance on Armistice Day, November 11, 1925. 500 guests, including the French Consul, General Pershing's Provost Marshal, the Mayor and dignitaries of Beverly Hills, a contingent of Army Reserve veterans, Soldiers Home, and a pair of Little Misses, America and France. Hunter and Hounds remained at Mr. Longyear's home till sometime around his death, when his family executed his wish to gift the statue to the city of Beverly Hills on condition that it continued to be displayed in a public place of honor which it has to, until today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Robert Metzner. And Mr. Metzner lives on a property that Mr. Neff's father designed the original estate. So, um, Mr. Metzner? I want to talk about the Warner Theater. Uh, I had very strong feelings when that theater was torn down. I was about 14 years old at the time, and I used to come over and play on the uh, construction site. I don't know whether any of you remember the ceiling in that theater, but the marvelous thing about it was that the staff, and then it was covered with gold leaf. 
I would stand down below while they were putting the gold leaf up, and they would trim off the uh, unused parts of it. It would fall to the floor, and I would go around the floor collecting all this gold, and I was going to make a nugget. And I kept squeezing it and squeezing it and squeezing it, and no matter how much I picked up and how much I pressed it, it never turned out to be much of anything. <laughs> you know, there was an effort to save it at the time, and there should have been more of an effort, because that was really a work of art, that theater. It's unfortunate to this day, it's a vacant lot. In uh, 1963, we uh, rebuilt the house considerably, but the one thing that impressed us, and that we didn't have to do any rebuilding was the marvelous wall that uh, ran across the 200 feet of the front of our property. And uh, we didn't know at the time what the significance of that wall was, except that we found similar walls as we walked around the corner. And then one day we noticed these very ornate gates, which uh, are in front of uh, 920 North Doheny, and also were in front of Arthur Gary's house. Gates are just a wonderful work of wrought iron. Well, then alongside of the gates, we see impressed into the gate post is the name B-A-Y-E-R-K-N-O-L-L, -L, which we thought was Bayer Knoll, like Bayer Aspen. I was talking to my accountant when they, the, uh, late Wally Muller, and uh, he said, you know, your address seems uh, rather uh, close to home to me. I used to play at my Auntie Byers' house. By any chance, is your house close to where that uh, Byer house was? That's the first time I knew that it was Byer, Noel, 1983 or 4 that Oral Roberts purchased the property at 648 Doheny. He had them, when they were reconstructing his house, tear out the uh, wrought iron and uh, stack the 12-foot sections, uh, evidently to be discarded. We used that uh, wrought iron to make uh, the entryway on our driveway and the uh, electric gates. Uh, cold roll steel tubing is already beginning to rust away <laughs> and uh, our uh, 60 or 70 year old wrought iron is in good shape. In the back of, the, uh, of our property we came across a stairway to nowhere and apparently was behind the uh, buyer home and led down into the lower part of the property which uh, Wally Muller told me was where they had stables. I'd like to introduce Mr. Um, Arthur Gary. I have the original gates that were there, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the entire wrought iron uh, fence at the front of the house. Uh, this wrought iron work is over 70 years old, is not rusted, and is in perfect condition, which uh, attests uh, wonderfully to the craftsmanship of uh, the people in, at that time. I had some elevator doors made, and lo and behold, they were made by the Bayer Metal Company. So they were still in business somewhere in the 60s or 70s, and uh, when I first uh, uh, started living in Beverly Hills, that center section on Sunset Boulevard and the center section going down Rodeo uh, Road were horse trails bridle path and uh, people would uh, uh, on, on Sunday you'd always see them uh, riding their horses uh, when I bought my lot uh, it was the garden section to the uh, buyer estate and they had formal rose gardens fruit trees and uh, big uh, specimen trees uh, in the area and uh, when we built our home, we saved all that we could. And uh, it's a joy to have a home with trees that are probably 100 years old. When the buyers uh, developed this, or whoever did, 
uh, they fill that all in. So you go by there and it looks level and beautiful, but uh, originally it uh, had a, a stream th uh, flowing through it. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Milton Weiss, owner of the wonderful Players Restaurant in Beverly Hills on Santa Monica at Rodeo Drive. We, in 1930, were living in a uh, tiny bungalow in the 300 block of North Rodale. Rodale, in 1930, was mixed. It still had a lot of wood frame houses. We had come uh, from Chicago, having uh, lost our money in the great uh, crash of 1929. We came to California uh, because we wouldn't freeze and because uh, there were stories about picking grapefruit off the trees. and. Uh, having a, a, an easier life. My father uh, opened a, a furniture store. He was a furniture maker on the North Beverly Drive. Uh, no sooner did he get the store open than uh, the bank uh, uh, that had his money closed. And uh, that, that hurt. He was doing, uh, he did a lot of the furniture at Pick Fair. Uh, repaired some of the furniture at the newly built uh, Beverly Wilshire Hotel and uh, did some work down in Palm Springs. I remember driving down there with him as a 12 year old in 1930. But there was a hotel called the Del Taquitz, which he, uh, he worked on. Another bank closed. He lost money in two banks and that, that really took the heart out of him. He found himself digging alleys uh, on the WPA uh, along with the stockbrokers and ex-bankers and other people who had lost everything. Uh, my mother went out to uh, get her first job, and uh, fortunately she landed a uh, job uh, cooking for a famous playwright whose name was Sam Berman, S.N. Berman, who was doing a movie. She had a great personality, so they, uh, they loved her there. He finished his movie. She opened a restaurant in this little bungalow. The things were uh, very tough. Uh, there were more people at our back door at that restaurant asking for food than there were at the front door. Uh, I have written a little history of those days, and I, I talk about the fact that the city of Beverly Hills opened its, uh, its jails so people could sleep at night. Uh, it was a time of the uh, great drought in the Midwest that Steinbeck writes about. And there were many people coming from there. And uh, these were uh, uh, just wonderful uh, citizens who had, uh, who had lost everything to, uh, to banks and uh, who just walked away from their uh, dried up farms and ranches. The uh, people that my mother had known at Berman's house became sort of a nucleus of, uh, of the restaurant with the help of a famous person whose name was Mary Miles Minter, a, a great uh, star of her day. I think we borrowed two or three hundred dollars from her, which was a lot of money. We moved across the street to a large two-story house. Complete dinner, and I mean a lavish dinner was 65 cents. And, and it was truly a wonderful homemade European dinner. Uh, we had a steak on the, uh, on the menu. Uh, but frequently we didn't have a steak. So uh, when someone would order a steak, I would take uh, 20 cents or a quarter out of the uh, cash box and I would run across Wilshire Boulevard where there was a market at the corner of Wilshire and Camden. There was a rather large market there. And I would buy the steak and run back uh, to the uh, restaurant. And by the time the people had had their appetizers and their soup and their salad, the steak was ready. As the years went by, it became a, it was a rather famous uh, restaurant. Uh, everyone in the motion picture industry uh, was there. She would come out and sing little Hungarian songs or German leader at the, uh, at the end of an evening. And uh, we often would have to pull her back because we, we needed the table. The area around uh, the Civic Center Drive was like uh, there was a wonderful uh, lumber yard called Sun Lumber. 
uh, everybody got their, uh, their building materials. And there was a Union Ice Company that uh, served us ice and served it to the rest of the community. If you will remember the Wonder Bed Breakery that, that was there, and, and you had that great bouquet as you were either uh, driving down the street or riding your horse on Sunset Boulevard. We, we frequently rode uh, Sunday mornings, and it was a very colorful thing. So I thank you for listening. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Fred Nason, Jr., whose family has lived in Beverly Hills many, many years. Hi, my name is Fred Nason, Jr., and I'm, I guess I can say I'm a native of Beverly Hills. When the big grandfather, her father, built the first Beverly Hills City Hall, which was down on Little Santa Monica Boulevard, it's since been torn down. He also built the Horseman School over on St. Robertson, Charleville. And uh, he built what was called the Arcane. It was on the site of the present Bank of America building at the corner of Little Santa Monica and Beverly Drive. He also built the little shopping center that's down at the corner of Wilshire Boulevard and San Vicente, across from the 8383 building. His mother and father also moved to Beverly Hills in 1924. My dad went to USC where he met my mother. They were the first couple married in the sanctuary of the Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. My grandmother announced my mother's engagement to my father in Bungalow 2 of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Beverly Hills Transfer and Storage Company it was organized in 1924. My father joined the company in 1928. He first bought a quarter interest in the company, then he bought another quarter interest, and uh, about 1930, he took over the company as president, which he remained until 1980. And Jerome Kern was getting ready to move, and before he would even talk to him about his moving, before he talked to my father about his moving, he had my father sit down, and he played for about a half an hour his songs and sang, and uh, right at the piano, my dad said it was something out of this world. He never forgot it. Maybe 35 years ago, Dinah Shore and George Montgomery were living together, and they were getting ready to move. I really wanted this job badly. I was selling like crazy as we were going through the house. All of a sudden, in walked Dinah, and uh, I told her, Mrs. Montgomery, I want you to know I'm one of your greatest fans. I never miss your show, and I think you're absolutely fabulous. Well, she turned to her husband, and she said, give him the job, George. The fact that my father graduated from college, he didn't have any plans. So, uh, he... Uh, his roommate at the time said, come on, Freddie, let's go up to downtown L.A. and see what kind of trouble we can get into. And so they went up and they, uh, they bought a bottle of Dago red wine and proceeded to get uh, mildly intoxicated. Well, the police picked them up and took them into the police station. And uh, my dad said, you can't put us in jail. He said, why not? He said, because my father owns the jail, which happened to be his father owned the building that the jail was in. So one way or another, they talked themselves out of going to jail about 2 o'clock in the morning. They got out, and between them, they had 35 cents. So they hailed a taxi driver. They asked the taxi driver to please give them 35 cents worth back to the USC campus, back towards the USC campus, and they'd walk the rest of the way. Well, the, the taxi driver was a pretty good guy, and he drove them all the way for the 35 cents. Well, we had a picture of, of my dad's roommate hanging in our office, and it had written on it by him, it said, Hey, Freddie, where's that taxi driver? I'll get back our 35 cents. And it signed, Duke. John Wayne. I think that's a good story to close on. I thank you very much for this opportunity to play a little bit of time with this. Thank you. Look at the wonderful renderings that Mr. Neff brought. Thank you all for coming. Learning all about Beverly Hills, I've always known about it, but to hear everything, everything about it, and um, we're new here, so it really was very interesting. Very educational. I wanted to get up and.
tell my friend some about his re mother's rest. <laughs> I've been in Beverly Hills for 50 years, and uh, What's your name, my name is Edna Ruby, and I wrote the book called Shorthead with Champagne, which is in the Beverly Hills Library about Beverly Hills, the hotel. To me, this was absolutely fascinating. I first came uh, to Beverly Hills to work in 1948, and I've lived here for 31 years now. Each and every one of them had something unique to say, something remarkable to say because it's historic and it will never happen again. Out some of the places where I had lived, so I, I enjoyed it a lot. Very good. And they, you know, they give you a little of information of what it used to be like here. It's stimulating, learning so much about Beverly Hills. Now when I'm going to walk through Beverly Hills, I'm going to look at all the different places and really take a good look. <laughs> It was an interesting evening. Yeah, I, learned, I learned a lot when I was putting this stuff together that I didn't know about Beverly Hills. Everybody's having a wonderful time. The food is, the refreshments are great. The whole panel is wonderful. And of course I learned a lot tonight.